Welcome to the Hornets Hivecast, the official podcast of your Charlotte Hornets. Here's your host, Sam Farber. Welcome to another edition of the Hornets Hivecast, your daily podcast with all the notes, quotes, and daily buzz around your favorite NBA team, the Charlotte Hornets. I'm Sam Farber, and it is a pleasure and a privilege to have you with us here today, a somewhat significant Hornets Hivecast, as this is our 100th ever edition of the HHC. We're glad to have you here for it. We'll be breaking down last night's loss to the Boston Celtics. Sadly, yeah, it's a silver linings edition and then some as the Hornets lost 116 to 86. We'll talk about the loss. We'll talk about the road ahead. And we're going to talk about a mock draft that got posted to NBA.com. It's actually Bleacher Report's mock draft. Normally, I wouldn't bring them up this early, but it was an interesting one. And one of the picks that is attributed to the Hornets in this in particular, I think might be of interest to you. So we'll talk about that in just a moment here with our guest for today. Again, a special one, the 100th edition of the Hornets Hivecast, My How Time Flies. Matt Ratchinski, Senior Director of Digital Media for the Charlotte Hornets, here with me to ring in the occasion. And Matt, I know, you know, it's it was kind of a dud of a game last night. We will break it down in a moment. But This is like 100 out of, what, 103 days that we've had the podcast on. That's pretty impressive, and I admire your commitment to this and trying to get better each and every day with this thing. I think I was on episode two is when I first started here. You know, we had that Mitch Kupchak guy to kick this whole thing off. So it's it's great to see where you've taken this thing so far, Sam. I enjoy listening to it. I know our fans do, and and want more of them to listen to it as we continue to grow this thing. Pretty excited about it. So 100, just the start, the first 100. Let's look at it that way. That's right. And as you mentioned, number one was a significant guest because we had Mitch Kupchak on to kind of ring in the season and I'll tell you right now normally we save the teases for the end but episode 101 another big guest is going to be on the Hornets Hivecast tomorrow we will have Terry Rozier for an in-depth one-on-one interview so get ready tomorrow for another edition episode 101 of the Hornets Hivecast will feature Terry Rozier but first we got to break down last night's game and there's not a ton of positive to look at Hornets lost 116 to 86 I guess on the bright side they outscored Boston 26 to 25 in the first quarter, but then the floor kind of fell out from under them. Boston kept the pedal to the metal, and the Hornets just could not keep up. They fall by 30, their most lopsided loss of the season, their lowest scoring effort of the season. Matt, your thoughts on this game? Man, I'll tell you what, it was nice to see the way things kind of started. You're right. We jumped out, came out, you know, guys were on fire, hitting three balls. You know, it was Terry Rozier, Devontae Graham knocking them down. Hit her first four threes of the game, looking pretty good. Got an 18-9 lead, and then we didn't hit another three the rest of the first half. So that's obvious. A big setback for the team. When you're looking to try and find some extra offense, when you've got as many guys out as you do as of right now, you need to find shots, and you need to hit shots. And we just were not hitting those shots. They were not falling yet. Coach Borrego said it after the game. This is a lot to have to deal with in a very short period of time, these injuries, as they've kind of stacked up on each other. So now you're trying to figure out what to do with this roster as you have it and trying to make it as easy for these guys all to transition into what are going to be new roles and what we're seeing out there on the court. So early on, when the shots were falling, things were feeling good. It was great. But then if once those st- shots stop falling, that's when you really need somebody to step up. And, and for us, unfortunately, it just wasn't happening on that evening. Unfortunately, yeah, that is the case. Uh, Hornets fall 116 to 86 in this one. Before we get to our silver linings, a couple of things on this one. Boston obviously has not been playing that well in terms of wins and losses. But overall, I think they've been getting too much negative attention just focusing on the record and not enough positive attention for how they've actually played. The results aren't there, but in terms of how well they're playing per 100 possessions and all those kinds of statistics, it's actually better than you might think. In terms of point differential, which I think is the truest measure of just how good a team is, the Celtics are the fourth best team in the Eastern Conference. They're at a plus 1.8. So, you know, Brooklyn, Philadelphia, and Milwaukee, they're in a class amongst themselves. That's the top three clearly in the Eastern Conference. But Boston is number four in terms of point differential, and the Hornets have kind of been playing over their heads. They've been so good in clutch time, they make up for some other deficiencies out there. They have been number 10 in the point differential. Obviously, last night's game not helping that cause very much. So that's one. I think you know this is a very good Celtics team with three current or former All-Stars on it who, if they're playing up to their level at home, more often than not should be favored against most teams in the Eastern Conference that are not Brooklyn, Philadelphia, and Milwaukee. 
and should definitely be favored against a Hornets team that is playing without LaMelo Ball, Gordon Hayward, and Malik Monk. That is a lot to overcome. I thought the Hornets made a good effort in the first quarter, uh, but it, it should not be a shock that Boston, with all the firepower they have, was able to get a win, even if the score differential is a bit jarring. Well, and let's be honest, too, the, the Celtics started off slow themselves. You know, you talked about all those weapons they have, Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, our guy Kemba Walker, Marcus Smart. Like, all of those guys can be hitting three-pointers, can be hitting from the court, and, and tend to light the scoreboard up pretty quickly. Instead, Boston jumped out shooting one of eight from outside the arc, so they were not shooting well as we were shooting on fire, which gave us that first quarter advantage. But then things kind of, I think, regressed to the mean a little bit after that. You know, Boston finishes the half seven of 12 from beyond the arc. And I'll tell you what, adding a guy like Evan Fournier, like how nice of a move is that for the Celtics to have in their back pocket? Because he was the guy that really kind of sparked them and got them going again from outside the arc. It wasn't, you know, Jalen Brown. It wasn't Jason Tatum. It was Evan Fournier out there not knocking down threes. Yeah, he really is a key piece for them because I think that starting five for Boston was already really strong, measured up really well against, honestly, everyone in the Eastern Conference. I thought the drop-off between Boston and the top three teams in the East wasn't the starting group. It was the reserves. They didn't have enough punch off the bench, and now Fournier kind of gives that to them. So, you know, that's something for later on down the line when you're looking at this Boston team. But in the here and now, this matchup with the Hornets, it's just a tough one. I think Charlotte does measure up reasonably well if they have two out of the three injured players at least because then a guy like Miles Bridges goes to the bench and he can maybe take advantage of some of those matchups. Or, you know, you just have more frontline scoring, a bigger guy in Gordon Hayward to match up with someone like Jason Tatum. There's just more advantages there, but when you start stripping away all those pieces, it gets very difficult for the Hornets. Time, though, to give out our silver linings for this one, and granted, in a 116-86 loss, they're going to be tougher to find, but we got to find them nonetheless. Matt Rachinsky, Senior Director of Digital Media for the Hornets, what is your silver <laughs> lining for the Hornets on Sunday? I'm going to look at a guy like Brad Wanamaker. You know, you see Brad, he joined this team at the trade deadline. Not much was maybe really expected of him as he's had and then had to step into a larger role with Melo's injury and all of the things that have happened. But he's starting to get more and more comfortable. He seems as if he's fitting in with this team better, starting to feel like he's got a better grasp of the offense, better grasp of the defense. And he was pretty efficient tonight, going out there shooting three of seven, hitting the only three-pointer he made. Missed a couple free throws, don't want to see that, but he was also contributing, dishing out three assists and handing and grabbing two rebounds. So this is a guy who can step in and kind of fill in one of those roles for one of those guys coming off the bench who's going to make an impact. He's looking to make more of an impact. He's excited about getting more time. You know, he's looking forward to the next two days off, he said, after the game the other night. So obviously having these two days off is going to be big for a guy like him. So I feel like he's really starting to kind of find his way in this offense and in this season. Very good silver lining. I'm going to give mine to Nate Darling. Nate <laughs> has not played a ton this year. He's a rookie two-way player. I know the coaching staff likes his potential a lot as a kind of a sharpshooter. There's some potential there. Also the first NBA player ever from Nova Scotia. So he's got that mm -hmm. going for him. He did make a three last night. So he, you know, he has a, another one go through the cylinder. That's always good. He's now two of six on his NBA career from distance. Not bad for a rookie, 33% will take it. But I'm giving it to him because he took a charge from Taco Fall <laughs> with a minute left that, I mean, it was like a Mack truck hitting Wiley e. Coyote. It was, I mean, oh my God. Taco Fall, for those of you that have not seen him play in a game before, is seven foot five and is a very lean 310 pounds. And him just standing with his arms, you know, kind of down, has his elbows at Nate Darling's eye level because he's a foot taller than him. And Darling stood in there like a champ in a 30-point game and took this charge from Taco Fall, who with his elbows, like, you know, at normal height, was about to take Darling's head off. So I'm giving my silver lining to Nate Darling. He make a three. He took a charge from a guy a foot taller than him who outweighs him by 
I'm going to go out on a limb and say 125 pounds. He's my silver lining for tonight. You know what? I'll throw a double silver lining on him, too, because you're right. That's just a guy who loves the game of basketball. There is no doubt. There's no reason that he had to take that charge in that point in time in a 30-point game, but this is a guy who just was excited to be out there and is going to play the game hard no matter what his minutes are. So great job by Nate Darling last night as well. This is basically the equivalent of you or I, Matt, middle-aged men of normal size, (laughs) taking a charge from anyone who's not a guard on the Charlotte Hornets. I mean, how much would I have to pay you to say stand in the lane, and I'm not going to tell you which Hornet's going to come out, but he's not Terry Rozier and he's not Devontae Graham, and he gets to run you over. How much would I have to pay you to get you to stand there? I don't know if you could pay me enough. I don't know if my wife would allow you to pay me enough because I don't know if the medical bills would be worth it at this age. I mean, all I can harken back to is my one lone moment as a high school basketball player in in Detroit, Michigan, getting a chance to play against Chris Weber. Let's just say that did not go well when we played Detroit Country Day. Did you take a charge from Chris Weber? That that seems like the equivalent. You would have to take a charge from Chris Weber. Oh, no, I didn't take a charge. I couldn't stop him. There was no (laughs) doubt. He he just ran through me regardless. Oh, my goodness. Nate Darling, he gets my silver lining today, and Brad Wanamaker as well. Hornets hoping for brighter tomorrows. They get a couple days off here, and then they'll take on the Oklahoma City Thunder on Wednesday. We'll, of course, have our preview podcast for that one up for you on Wednesday. Tomorrow we'll have for episode 101 a special in-depth interview with Terry Rozier. But still more to come here on this edition of the Hornets Hivecast. Coming up next, there was a mock draft put out recently on NBA.com and some interesting picks from the Hornets. We'll tell you about them next on the HHC. Buzz City, it's time to return to the Hive. There are a limited number of socially distanced tickets available for each game. Fans can expect enhanced cleaning and disinfection procedures and an upgraded ventilation system at Spectrum Center because the health and safety of the team, staff, and guests is the top priority at the Hive. Be there at Spectrum Center for a Sunday matinee April 11th when the Hornets host Trey Young and the Atlanta Hawks at 1 p.m. Tickets on sale now at Hornets.com. Matt Rich. Senior Director of Digital Media for the Charlotte Hornets here with me, Sam Farber, today on the Hornets Hivecast. Glad to have you all along. Matt, it's a bit early to be looking at mock drafts. Normally I wouldn't do it because we don't know where the Hornets are going to pick. And given how congested the standings are, based off the result of the next game, they could find themselves in fourth or eighth. It's, yep. it's crazy. There's a game. There is one game right now, as I'm talking to you, separating number four, and number eight in the East. And the Hornets are right smack dab in the middle of it. So a lot can change in terms of the standings, seeding for the playoffs, as well as draft positioning. But this mock draft was put out based off Bleacher Report. Bleacher Report's the ones responsible for it. They allocate the picks out there. They've got Cade Cunningham, the all-everything freshman out of Oklahoma State, going number one. Evan Mobley, who's my favorite player in the draft, the center out of USC, going number two. Right now that's to Houston. Jalen Suggs, who had the new Christian Leitner replacement for one shining moment here and for all time (laughs) from Gonzaga's shot at number three. And then Jalen Green out of the G League team and Jonathan Kaminga out of the G League team going four and five. In this mock draft, it's currently got the Hornets at number 19. So not in the lottery, obviously, because the Hornets are currently in a postseason position, but still picking in the top 20. They gave the Hornets Isaiah Jackson, who is a center from Kentucky. This Kentucky team last year was really really underwhelming. Jackson's an interesting prospect. I I can't say that I saw a ton of him, um, but I know that he is a young man who is growing. When he was put in the ESPN 100 from Pontiac, Michigan, by the way, Waterford Mott High School, he was six foot eight, 185 pounds listed as a power forward. Now, as a center for Kentucky, he's 6'10 and 206 pounds. So, In about a year from when, you know, ESPN put out their 100, he's grown two inches and put on 20 pounds. So this is a guy who is growing. Uh, Granted, you know, it was not a very good year for Kentucky last season. But, you know, this is a a guy who averaged eight and a half points per game. He's, you know, did a decent job on the glass at times. As with a lot of youngsters, when you're drafting them as freshmen out of college, you know, you're looking at a lot of potential. And that's really what you're looking at with Isaiah Jackson. The one thing that I really like about that, just hearing you say it, is that if you've grown two inches but put on 20 pounds in that kind of span, 
putting on 20 pounds when you're kind of in that college area, when, when these guys look like they're ready to play basketball, but they're not quite into that grown man kind of body yet, this is a kid who's getting, showing that he can get to that point. If you're able to put on that kind of weight, that's one of the things that a lot of talented players struggle with so much is being able to actually put on weight. And when you're one of those guys who makes that kind of a leap with both that weight and that length, that's going to make you incredibly athletic as you continue to build your basketball skills. I mean, that's, that's why you're seeing that this guy's a five who can run the court. That's why I think they think he would be such a great fit for us because getting up and down, as we've seen, we're adding that athleticism in at each and every position as we've gained new players every year and Mitch has rounded out this team. You need a big athletic big to start running the floor with these guys. And look, I trust Mitch Kupchak a heck of a lot more than I trust yes. any mock draft on picking these yeah. guys out. But just I thought it was an interesting selection. There are yeah. two second-round picks that are attributed to the Hornets, and I'm only going to talk about one of them. It's the later one. But I thought it was a very interesting name. It's Luke Garza, the reigning NCAA Player of the Year out of Iowa. Now, not every mock draft includes Luke Garza. It's been well documented, all the work he put in in this last offseason to prepare himself for his final year at Iowa and also to try and make himself a more attractive player for the NBA. But I, I have always been a big believer, Matt. Maybe it's just wanting to see some of the experienced college guys succeed, but I think if you have been that productive at college, especially at a big school like Iowa where you're constantly playing you know, teams like Michigan State and you're playing against other projected NBA players, if you can be that productive – there's a decent chance you're going to find space in the NBA. And, and because we're in an era where so many young guys come into the league and they're projects, they're developmental, they need to grow physically and mentally into the NBA game, a guy like Luke Garza, who is fully developed as an adult man now in terms of you know his size mm -hmm. and his strength and has shown an ability to score 20-plus points per game for a while now, that's an attractive piece. And if you're picking in this mock draft, it's saying third to last in the NBA draft, why not take a flyer on a guy like Luke Garza? He certainly fits the position that the Hornets are supposed to be looking for the most. And again, in productivity from the college ranks, I don't think you can get any better than Luke Garza. No, and I would agree with you. I remember talking with Miles Bridges when he came in, you know, coming out of the Big Ten. Obviously, I got a little big, bit of Big Ten bias, let's be honest, from Michigan. But at the same time, coming out of the Big Ten, I talked to Miles about, you know, you guys used to practice with football pads on. Is this true? Is that how he, that Coach Izzo would kind of set things up to practice against the Big Ten? And he said, that's just what it is. That's what it's like. And there is a need for that player in the game. There is a need for somebody who has the ability to not only score inside, but also can be physical down low. Yes, you're seeing more and more teams go to that four or five interchangeable player, but there's still guys out there that can be big, that can make an impact more so than just Taco Fall. The last thing I'll throw out about Luke Garza, and, and considered to be kind of a slower, less athletic big, that's the big question mark, I think, for him in the NBA. One other thing that makes him attractive to me, he shot 44% from three in his senior season. Yeah. So, you know, he averaged 24 points per game, basically the same thing he did his junior year where he was dominant again. But his shooting percentage rose eight, nine points from his junior year to his senior year at the three-point arc. Granted, it's a longer shot in the NBA, but he's going to have to be able to stretch the floor a little bit. He's going to have to fit himself into the NBA game. It was an interesting selection. I wouldn't have brought up the mock draft if he hadn't been there. We'll just have to see how things play out. You know, obviously in the second round, we, we know our guy Mitch has always got some sleepers hidden that he's taking a look at. But a guy like Luke, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't have a problem looking at a guy like him late in, in a draft. Because you're right, this is the second leading scorer in, in the NCAA. And he changed his game so that he can make himself more attractive to play the NBA game. This is a guy who's committing himself and wants to hit that next level. I think that there's going to be a team that will take a flyer on him that won't be a bad idea. We'll see how it all shakes out. Hopefully the Hornets draft as late as possible because that means they would yeah. be rising in the standings. And speaking of which, Hornets are in that top six mix right now in the Eastern Conference. We're going to talk about the road ahead as the Hornets get a couple of off days and then get back to work. Talking about all these things with Matt Ruchinski here on the Hornets Hivecast. Hornets fans, during the month of April, the Charlotte Hornets and their official hunger relief partner, Food Lion Feeds, are launching the 2021 Dunk Hunger Food Drive to benefit Second Harvest Food Bank of Metrolina. The Bridges who throws it down with a right hand. For every Hornets dunk this month, slams it down with two hands. Food Lion will donate one 
1,000 meals. Terry Rozier throws it down over Kevin Durant. For more information on how you can help Food Lion and the Hornets dunk hunger, visit hornets.com slash dunk hunger. Sam Farber and Matt Richinski, Senior Director of Digital Media for the Charlotte Hornets, here with you on a special edition of the Hornet Typecast because it's number 100 all time of the HHC here in uh, season one of our daily podcast. Glad to have all of you with us here today, and thank you for all of your support all throughout the season. We really enjoy doing this for you and hope you've enjoyed it as well. I've enjoyed getting some fan interaction now that uh, fans are allowed in the building. Matt, every once in a while, someone will come up and say, hey, you know, we listen to the podcast every day, and it, it, you know, it's very nice of you to come up and to say that. I appreciate the appreciation and hope we're continuing to give you something you want and crave more Hornets content. I'm just happy that our fans are getting to not only see basketball, they're getting to see you. We were finally getting to introduce you to our fans and you're finally getting to see some faces of who our Hornets fans are out there that have been making all this noise so far this season. It's good to see the buzz back inside the Hive Spectrum Center. Hornets still have a couple more games before they get to return home. Before we get to that, Matt, yesterday on the podcast, we were I was talking to Rob Longo about a movie trailer that premiered the other day, the new Space Jam movie. What were your thoughts on it? You know what? It's tough because we know who the boss is. You know, we know who the goat is. We all love MJ. And it's, you know, it's one of those those movies, the first Space Jam, that not only that I loved and was absolutely a, a thought was one of the best movies of all time, but it also connected my kids to somebody like MJ. So I think that that was good to connect them that way so that by the time Last Dance came up, you know, they, they realized who this guy was. This could be a connector for LeBron. Do I think it's going to be as good as the, next, as the last one? Maybe graphically it's going to be better. Is it ever going to tell a better story than MJ himself? Probably not. But am I looking forward to seeing it? Do I think it can be something that could be entertaining? I actually think that it could be. I think, you know, he, it, LeBron, surprisingly, has done a pretty decent job in his acting roles thus far. But we'll see how it all goes. I'm looking forward to seeing who they might pull into this one. You know, we've heard some rumored names, but I'd be intrigued to see who is Who's going to give these guys their powers? Who are the pe- people we're going to be playing against? I am excited to see all of those things. I agree with you. I think LeBron's been a very good actor. It looks graphically very nice. I don't expect it to measure up to the original because my inner child will not allow me to have anything supersede the first Space Jam. But I'm quite frankly, I'm a bit surprised that Space Jam A New Legacy's trailer, which I thought was great, is not getting a better reaction. I I thought it was a very good trailer. It looks good. And I'm looking forward to, again, watching it with my inner child and my actual children later on this summer. I think it's going to be tremendous. I just wonder, here's my question for you, Ben. If you were going to steal some powers from some players in the NBA right now, I mean, we know there's some of these players that have been rumored to be in this. Who Who would you want to steal powers from at what positions well I, I mean i think i've got mine down i think just from a physical you know unicorn standpoint Giannis antetokounmpo someone that size skilled i mean it's ridiculous the man can run the entire length of the floor in like two steps he is just unique lebron james right now is the best player in the game and you know but he despite being a bigger human being kind of operates as a like you would assume a normal human being would move Giannis is something altogether different than we maybe have ever seen in the NBA I 100% agree with you LeBron uh, Giannis Kawhi was on there and here here's my one of my sleepers Terry Rozier man I want Terry I know you're having him on, on episode 101 but I say let's put Terry Rozier on that squad if you're looking for somebody who you need to win a game to save the galaxy Terry's a guy I have no problem put out running out on the court in that game he certainly got the clutch going for him there that's for sure there's no one more clutch right now clutch time is officially Terry time from now on Hornets hoping to get to some more clutch time during the road ahead so I mentioned earlier Matt it, it's a very crowded Eastern Conference right now Hornets as things sit at the moment They are a half game out of fourth place in the East. They're also a half game out of eighth place in the East. So every game is magnified. Coming up next after a two-day break, which is badly needed just to get the team, you know, back into a rhythm, hopefully, or or healthier. We'll keep our fingers crossed about Malik Monk. Really have nothing new to update you on as of now. And certainly there's no expectation that there will be any kind of super healing for LaMelo Ball or Gordon Hayward to have them back anywhere near in time for the remainder of this road trip. But they are taking on an Oklahoma City team that, I don't want to say they're trying to lose, but they're not upset about it from what we can tell. (laughs) 
they have not been performing very well by design. Oklahoma right. City is 20 and 29. Well, their last two games, they've lost on average by about 35 points each. So that's not good. And their three wins, they beat Toronto, which was a decent win. That was at home. Their other two wins are Minnesota and Houston. So, I mean, this is a Thunder team who I think there is some bonus to them to lose more aside from getting more ping pong balls. They're not a very good team right now. And even though they beat the Hornets way back on night two of the regular season, this is definitely a winnable game. And it seems to be one that the front office, at least for the Thunder, wouldn't mind if the Hornets took. There's no doubt about that that it is a winnable game. And it's crazy to think that when the second half of the schedule came out, Sam, we were talking about these two trips, right? The the first West Coast trip, then we came back for the two home games, and then we're out on this six-game trip. Only two games left in this trip. And your key, talking with us on this podcast, was one simple word, survive, right? At this point in time, you've got two games left out on this trip. You've lost two big players during the course of this trip, but you've still managed to go two and two. You're right. You have to look at this as an opportunity to go in there, kind of right the ship after a couple of days off, hopefully have guys like Brad Wanamaker who are going to be contributing more. Jalen McDaniels, get him more acclimated. These guys are going to watch a ton of video over the course of the next two days. I would have to assume as coach kind of breaks down how to get these guys more involved in the offense and they need to come out strong with a great performance in Oklahoma City after the two-day break to push us to 3-2 and two on this trip so that that way when you go to Milwaukee, if you come back 3-3, three and three, great. If you can pull off a big win in Milwaukee to cap off the trip, even better. I'll take it. But if we can finish this trip 3-3 three and three, knowing the kind of injuries we've had to sustain, I consider that such a huge win for us, and we've done exactly what you said we had to do. We've survived. I think they've done better than survive because let's go back the 25-day period from March 17th until April 9th. So that was the start of that five-game Western Conference road trip. The two games at home, which, mind you, were not easy either. Miami and Phoenix are two very good basketball teams. And then this six-game, primarily Eastern Conference road trip. If you had said at the start of all that that the Hornets had a chance to go 6-7 and seven in those 13 games, I think you'd take it any day of the week because you know you're playing Denver and the two L.A.s and San Antonio on the road. Miami and Phoenix, again, those are not easy games. And on this road trip, they've seen Brooklyn, Indiana, Indiana, Boston, and Milwaukee by the time it's all over. To take 6 of 13 from that 25-day stretch, I think it's a pretty good accomplishment. You're right. To win six games out of that run of games that we were talking about there, I think none of us would have predicted that. And to not only not lose ground, but gain ground throughout this whole process, It's been great to see in the standings. And one last thing before we call it a day for the podcast here. I think the fact that the Hornets have been in fourth for a good stretch here, it feels a little bit, based off the reaction online and everything else, that Hornets fans feel like the team is losing something by dropping from fourth to fifth and potentially further down. When the reality is, as Mitch Kupchick has said several times, this team is ahead of schedule. Making the playoffs has been the goal the entire time. And to do that, you have to be in the top 10. And even with this latest loss to Boston, the Hornets have a six-game lead over the number 11 team with 23 games remaining on the schedule. So they're in an excellent position to accomplish their season goal. We mentioned it was survive at the start of the second half. Advance is coming. It's going to be a much more home-laden, much more friendlier opponents for the Hornets later on in the second half of the schedule. And if they catch some breaks and get Malik Monk and Gordon Hayward and maybe, just maybe, LaMelo Ball back, this could be a special run down the stretch. So long way of saying, Matt, I feel like you know people might be a little down in the dumps after this Boston loss, seeing the Hornets slide down in the standings when if Boston and Atlanta and Miami had just performed up to what we thought they would have, and the Hornets didn't lose spots in the standings, just you know, were closer to 500 than they were the day before, you might feel better about this. Yeah, I don't think the sky is falling. I don't think that there's anything that fans need to be up in arms about just yet from one loss to Boston. This is the first time we saw them. It's the first time Coach Borrego's had to kind of put this lineup together without all three of these players out on the court at the same time. 
Coach is going to come up with something new. We're going to see something that he's going to pull out of his bag of tricks. We know that Coach has really been tremendous at this all season long whenever he's been faced with this adversity. So I think we're going to see him make those changes. We're going to see this team step up, and we'll continue and hopefully move on to that advanced part. Rare two-day gap in games to try and rehab, recuperate, and get back on the winning track on Wednesday against the Oklahoma City Thunder. Uh, We'll again have our preview podcast that day, but appreciate you helping break down what ended up being a lemon of a game in Boston, but we always find the silver linings. Matt Rachinsky, thank you so much for making your triumphant return and joining us here today on the Hornets Hivecast. Thanks a lot. And thanks to all of you for tuning in as well. A reminder, tomorrow's special, episode 101 of the Hornets Hivecast, Terry Rozier will be with us for the full episode. We'll have an in-depth conversation about him, how this season has gone for him, get to know the man a little bit better and of course look at the road ahead for the Hornets through the eyes of one of their top players that is coming up tomorrow right here on the HHC till then for Matt Rachinsky and everyone here with the Hornets I'm Sam Farber saying it's been a pleasure and a privilege having you with us on the Hornets Hivecast and in the words of LaMelo Ball thank you have a good day wear your mask thanks for listening to the Hornets Hivecast for more coverage visit Hornets.com